please welcome Dr. John White. Well, I want to thank you for that very kind introduction, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. As it mentioned yesterday, a small but mighty group in terms of organizing all of these folks. I also want to thank Joe Keani for inviting me. Now, I met Joe earlier this year, and at WebMD and Medscape, we have this signature series called Change Makers, the Future of Health where we only profile about four CEOs a year who our team believes are really reshaping the future of health. Joe's name was brought up. I had not known him previously. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go out to California and meet with him and interview him. And I've met many CEOs in my role at WebMD and in previous positions. I have to say, Joe is really one of those exceptional leaders that inspire. I learned from him the concept of micro-fixing that he referenced yesterday. But what was truly inspirational, and I think relevant to what we're talking about today and this weekend, here I am talking to him, I think about the future of health, which we did. But he also talked about injustice and disparity, and how we need to tackle big things. And that's what inspired me from our conversation. So I want to recognize Joe for that, because there aren't a lot of leaders who have that focus. So I want to talk a, a little differently today, in terms of a different perspective, about the role of information and in more importantly, misinformation, and how that's one of the greatest threats to patient safety. So we've spent a lot of time talking about what's happening in the inpatient. I'd argue we have to talk also what's happening outpatient, what's happening in the home. And there's good and bad. So I'll start off with some statistics. A billion, a billion health-related queries a day. Now, they all don't end up at WebMD. There's lots of places that they go to. But that's what's happening every day, where people are going to get information. And search has changed. Some of you may remember how patients used to search information online, right? They printed things up. We wasted a lot of paper back then, didn't we? They bring it to the doctor's office. And what would the doctor do? He or she would put it to the side eventually in the trash, and just do whatever he or she was going to do to begin with. That's not how search happens nowadays. Now patients come in, and they may tell me what they think they have. They may say, a patient said to me the other day, that he thought he had costochondritis. It wasn't exactly right, but it wasn't a bad thought in terms of a differential. And I'd argue that search continues to change. There's a lot of symptom checkers. WebMD has a symptom checker, but you put in information, and then it'll tell you what you may need to be concerned about. It doesn't tell you a diagnosis in all of these, but it, it gives you some information. But search has even changed since then. So I'll give you an example. I, I have uh, two boys. My older one is 11. Um, and he is, um, I wouldn't say he's a hypochondriac, <laughs> WebMD, but he's very concerned about his body. So a few weeks ago, he tells me, I should say by texting, he's in the basement, I'm upstairs, he texts me, he says, I think I have an ear infection. That's what he says. Now, I told you he, he's very concerned about his body, but also he's never had an ear infection, so I've been lucky. He's never had one at 11. So I go downstairs. Now, I'm not a pediatrician. I'm an internal medicine physician, so I, I don't have a pediatric otoscope at home. But I, you know, I, I look at him. He doesn't have a fever. His mouth looks OK. And I say, you know what? I think it's your premolars that are coming in. The dentist said that, because you're having some tooth pain. So I said, let's you know, take some Tylenol and see how you do it. He's fine all day. And the next day, he says, um, around dinner time, he says, 
and it's a Friday, so I'll point that out. He says, I think we need to go to urgent care. He, he doesn't <laughs> tell me sometimes. He says he thinks he needs, and he's been to urgent care a few times. So he thinks he needs to go to urgent care. So I look at him again, I was like, oh, you know, your, your throat's not sore, you don't have a fever, there's usually other symptoms, but I do actually say, but I'm not a pediatrician. Um, I said, but we can see how things go another 24 hours. And we're at the dinner table, and he says to our Alexa, he asks Alexa, can toothache be signs of an ear infection? Of course, Alexa says yes. You know, tooth pain can mean ear infection. And at this point, I know game's over, uh, that we're going <laughs> to urgent care. And I know it's better to go earlier rather than later. But here, here, I'm a doctor, you know, and his dad at the dinner table, and he believes Alexa. I did take him to urgent care, and he did have an ear infection, <laughs> according <laughs> to the ER doctor. Uh, but what I wanted to point out for his age and his generation, he's not going to Google. He's not looking around on the site about you know, where he's going and where he's getting the information. He's just using voice search. And that's more and more prevalent. Asking Siri, asking Alexa, those are continuing to change. That'll be the issue of generative AI and ChatGPT. And we're not thinking about that in terms of where people are getting information. And there's harm and there's good. And as leaders in the patient safety movement, we need to be addressing this. The, uh, who's on TikTok? Anyone? Okay. I see Joe says he's on TikTok. I'm going to have to check out your page. But you know what's the biggest profession on TikTok? Any idea? It's physicians. Physicians are the number one profession, then followed by teachers. And, and how are physicians communicating this information? How are they giving people good content? Can you really do it in 30 seconds or a minute? Maybe. I'm not going to give all the details about that during this brief conversation, but I wanted to point out how important it is to recognize the importance of search. Because when people search online, they want to connect it to care nowadays. They want to do something. They want to get an x-ray if they feel they have a cough. They want to be able to talk to an orthopedist if they have joint pain. Patients' expectations have changed. And we need to be able to address that. And part of the challenge becomes, what's the average wait time? to see a physician in an outpatient setting. It can be 20, 30, 40 days. In terms of some fields, it can be 50 days. People do not want to wait 50 days to, make an, to get an appointment with a clinician. So are they going to do something at home that may put them at risk? And, and sometimes they do something at home that is a good thing. But I spend a lot of time in these transitions <laughs> like them. <laughs> So we have to recognize that as we think about the delivery of care, and, and patient safety is inherent in the delivery of care, how do patients' expectations change? And inherent in that is, what is their satisfaction with the level of care that they're receiving? And, and that's really important to keep in mind because sometimes we talk about patients as consumers, but their expectations have changed. They want to be connected. Right? You heard a bit about they want to be able to talk to their doctor, and that's important. And sometimes that's not through the phone, that's through texting. They want it to be convenient for them on their time. They want to be in control of their data. That's a whole nother discussion as we talk about patient safety. Who controls the data, and how do patients get access to their data? And what's the cost of care? People are more sensitive to that nowadays. And the other big aspect, as we think about patients getting information online, is also the fact that we now can bring care to the patient. And I would argue that is very much a good thing. And how many of us are wearing 
a wearable, some type of smartwatch, right? It is a burgeoning industry and it's collecting important data. But how are we using that data? If we detect more atrial fibrillation, as is the case with Apple Watches, and we're putting patients on oral anticoagulation that they are, may, may not have needed, we know there can be serious adverse events with oral anticoagulants. So how do you weigh that risk versus benefit? Now, we also will detect a lot of patients that may not have known they had AFib, which predisposes them to stroke and cardiovascular disease. But how are we addressing that with patients? How are we making sure they get the best information? I mean, this is growing, and that's a good thing because it's empowering patients, right? Who thought before the pandemic that you could ever do a lab test at home? Anyone? And now everyone has done COVID tests at home and could argue that's a good thing in terms of getting that information to patients. But it also has expanded. You know what one of the biggest sellers is for home lab tests? Cortisol levels. I'd like to say it'd be lipid levels or A1C that we have associated. Everyone's measuring their cortisol levels and thyroid levels at home, right? And what do we sometimes see with, you know, adrenal distress and some other conditions that have come up online, right? Those potentially expose patients to harm. So here we want to empower patients with good information because better information is going to lead to better health. We want to make it more convenient for patients by empowering them with their own data, right? Why does it make sense nowadays that a patient has to drive 20, 30 minutes or take public transportation to the doctor's office, wait another 20, 30 minutes, you know, for the visit that lasts 10 to 15 minutes and then do it all over again. If there is a truly better way to do it. And, and that's what many of these empower. There's actually now in the FDA approved it STD tests that you can do at home. Right? And I will tell you, when I first came to WebMD, well, we had an opportunity that if you search signs and symptoms of STDs, we would send you a link to be able to get a test without having to go see a physician. It depended upon what state you lived in, because as you know, uh, states regulate uh, pharmacy and the practice of medicine. And at first I thought, oh, like we can't do that. You know, we have to talk about safe sex practices. I have to talk about all these other things. But you also have to recognize that some of the improvements have to be incremental, right? If I can get more people tested that otherwise might not have gone in for a variety of reasons, that can be a good thing, but how do we address it? But we're not having those conversations. And as we think about even what's happening in the hospital setting, we have all this unstructured data still that is causing error. And how do we structure it? And here we're collecting more data, all the information from our wearables, which we're going to continue to get more and more. How do we structure it in a way that's going to help with more accurate diagnosis and more personalized treatment? And that's where I think, you know, artificial intelligence comes in. And just for you to consider that supercomputers can do as many calculations in a single second as an individual can in 32 billion years. Think about that. And how do we use that to improve patient safety? And you know much of this 800,000 at least medical errors a year in mostly diagnosis right? In things that are common, and, and we just heard that through that powerful video about the role of sepsis. We're not talking about rare diseases. We're not talking about unusual conditions. And here we're trying to empower patients with information. We are strict on time. I see I'm right <laughs> on time. But when we think about the role of AI, and, and I'll, I will tell you there are people that are very supportive of it, you know this, and people that aren't. I would argue that we haven't even scratched the surface in the power of AI. And if we can show in some areas, perhaps in radiology, as this study references, then is there a moral imperative to use a tool that actually can give better diagnosis? Because if I told you, if, if I use an AI-supported tool in radiology 
to detect breast cancer. I'm not replacing the physician, I'm augmenting it. Would you rather have that tool along with the radiologist that will detect more cancers? Or would you say, no, I just want to go with the radiologist? If we're a system, should we allow that to be the case when we know there may be a better tool? Now, there are still lots of areas where we have to make progress in this. But what I want to encourage all of you is to think about how do you become more involved in addressing misinformation, addressing the potential benefits of AI in a productive way. And I point this out coming from Washington, D.C., where you know, a lot of people have talked about the role we need more regulation. You know, we need more you know, laws. In terms of, in my full disclosure, I worked at CMS, I worked at FDA. <clears throat> Lots of times, the regulators, they're the cops, they're the police. I'm going to get the bad apples. That's not necessarily how you make the best policy. And Washington, <clears throat> as Joe and others know, is a very partisan place, particularly right now. It's very hard to get things done. <clears throat> what we really need, and why I was so excited to come to the conference, is we need more Sherpas. We need all of you to be the leaders as healthcare is evolving, particularly in the outpatient setting, particularly as more and more care is being done at the home that we never thought that we could do before. And how are we addressing that? And how are we addressing the changing physician-patient dynamic, which is changing in a good way? which is empowering patients, which is focusing on patients, which is emphasizing patient-driven care. But everything that we've been talking about for the last day and a half, if we don't address the issue of misinformation, if we don't address the issue of unstructured data, we're not going to make the progress that we really all are desiring. So I'm always happy uh, to answer emails and, and, and hop on the phone, and I'm going to be here for the rest of the conference. I'll enjoy engaging with folks. But, but think about these things as it relates to misinformation and how it impacts patient safety. So thank you all.